Welcome, and thank you for joining us on this reflective journey of the passion of Jesus from the perspective of those who had a close personal relationship with Jesus or who were present during his crucifixion. You will have the opportunity tonight to focus on certain objects as you listen closely to the words being spoken. It is our prayer that as you enter into his story, that you will feel his presence and the passionate love that he has for you. Because we are worshiping from separate locations, you have been invited to have a few things ready so that you can actively participate in tonight's service. These things are as follows. A small amount of oil. It can be baby oil, essential oil, even cooking oil. A small bowl of water and a hand towel. A piece of bread or a small roll, cracker, cookie, as well as some sort of juice, water, tea, so that you can participate with us in communion. And also an unlit candle and a lighter or a match. You will be instructed at the appropriate time in the service as to what to do with each. And tonight we will encounter four people who had front row seats in this incredible real life drama. They were Mary, the friend of Jesus, Simon Peter, Judas, and a Roman centurion. Sometimes the passion of Jesus feels only like a story to those of us who have heard it so many times before, but it is real. It was painful and rich and life-changing for generation after generation of Christians to follow. But how much more for those who lived then and loved this man named Jesus? Just as we have found that there are gifts in the wilderness, these people perhaps also found their place in the world, their true calling, as a result of a walk in the wilderness of life. Let us allow these ancient people to call us more deeply into our faith story. Enter, come into the story, into the place you belong. Not just looking on, for this is your story. Enter the story. Enter, enter the passion. Enter the place you belong. Not just looking on, for this is our passion. Into the passion, into the story, into his passion. The first person we encounter tonight is Jesus' dear friend Mary, whom we read about in the Gospel of John, chapter 12, verses 1 through 11. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, the home of Lazarus, who he had raised from the dead. There they gave a dinner party for him. Mary took a pound of costly perfume made of pure nard, anointed Jesus' feet, and wiped them with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas objected. Why was the money not used to feed the poor? Jesus said, leave her alone. She bought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. I was in the middle of the marketplace the day that it hit me like an overwhelming wave of feeling. I loved him so much. It was a love beyond anything I had ever known. Not romantic, not like a sibling, Certainly like family, but he was so much more to me. He was a teacher. He was priest. He was wise one. He was hope itself. And for the first time in those days before the terrible thing happened, I felt he might not be invincible. He had told us. He had warned us. He had been saying this could happen all along, but I just couldn't imagine it. He was so eternal, it seemed. 
Like nothing, not even God, would dare to take him away from any of us. But the tension was building. I will beg him, I thought, not to go to Jerusalem. Just go back to Galilee. Go to the hills. Go to Nazareth. Go anywhere but Jerusalem right now. But even as I thought it to myself, I knew that he wouldn't go. This is where he was supposed to be. With all these people gathered for Passover, Jerusalem is where he had to be. And I knew he might not ever leave. I suddenly became aware that I was standing stock still, oblivious to all around me here in the marketplace, and I began to double over with fear. But just as I did, my eyes came to rest on the stall to my right, a jar, a most beautiful jar of anointing oil. The seller offered it to me for a price that seemed outrageous, but I didn't care. No price could compare with the price my teacher, my master, would pay. And so I bought it. Whether in life or in death, my beloved friend would need it. Mary's anointing of Jesus belonged to the tradition of honoring someone with sweet-smelling oil made of a combination of many herbs. This was used at the consecration of kings, and also as an anointing for burial. In this one act, Mary offers signs of love and honor. The early Christians then used the same scented oil as part of their baptismal and confirmation rites to emphasize their new identity with Christ, which also means anointed one. So tonight, inspired by Mary's act, I invite you to take some of the oil you have available and anoint each other's foreheads, as those early Christians did, with a sign of the cross and the words, You are God's beloved child. If there was no one else in the room with you, then please mark your own head with the sign of the cross, knowing that other members of the body of Christ are with you in the action of anointing. You are God's beloved child. Enter, enter the passion, enter the place we belong, not just looking on, for this is a passion. Into the passion, into the story, into his passion. Next, we hear from Simon Peter, one of three of Jesus' disciples who were part of his inner circle. In the Gospel of John, chapter 13, verses 3 through 8 and 12 through 16. We read that when they finished supper, Jesus got up from the table, took off his outer robe, and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel. When Jesus came to Simon Peter, he said, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? After Jesus had washed their feet and returned to the table, he said, Do you know what I have done to you? Learn from me. You call me teacher, Lord. If I have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. He continually baffled me. My whole time with him, one surprise after another. Jesus turned my world upside down, especially when it came to relationships. We would worry about who would be his right-hand man, and he would always turn it around on us with his last shall be first stories. I wanted to know where I stood with him. I needed for him to be my Lord, my master, my teacher, and he was. Now, none of us were really of high lineage, 
but we weren't slaves or servants either. I mean, at the table that night, there were people to wait on us. This is the service that comes with any good room rented out for a meal. But I had planned to wash his feet that night. I was overwhelmed with my love for him and feared for his life. I had this nagging need to show him, demonstrate to him that I would do anything for him. But before I could even begin, he knelt before me. He insisted on washing my feet. I was horrified. I thought maybe he was losing his mind. One more time, he reversed the way I thought things should go. He just kept doing that. He said to me, you can't be a part of the family of God. The kingdom of God, Peter, if you don't let me do this. And I couldn't see that he, what he really meant, what he said about serving our neighbors, our friends, and our enemies. He always kept me off balance. I thought I knew what he meant. And then it seemed like I just wasn't getting it. I had to surrender all my preconceived ideas about how relationships are, how they go, who we love. I had to surrender and let his loving act of washing my feet heal my soul and heal every disappointing relationship I'd ever had. Jesus used water to model the kind of love we must have for one another a love that serves the least of our brothers and sisters. With the basin of warm water you have prepared, you're invited to watch you wash each other's hands around the table as you move the basin from one person to the next. If you are participating on your own tonight, please dip your hands in the water knowing that it is the Spirit of God that washes your hands. Let this be a symbol of our commitment to love our neighbors. Enter into the passion, into the place we belong, not just looking on, for this is our passion. Into the passion, into the story, into his passion. From the Gospel of John, chapter 13, verses 21 through 30, we learn that Jesus was troubled in spirit that night. And he said, I'm telling you, one of you is going to betray me. The disciples looked at each other, not sure who or what he was talking about. Peter leaned over to Jesus and said, Lord, who is it? Jesus turned to Judas and gave him his own piece of bread. Go quickly, Jesus said to him. Do what you are going to do. I was so angry with him. Why wouldn't he fight? We had so many followers by this time, and so many were in Jerusalem right now. Why did he insist on this blessed are the meek stuff? I think all along I'd hoped that this was going to be the revolution, that we would finally stand up to the Romans. He had such power and charisma. Couldn't he have done anything this Son of God? I suppose my bitterness finally took over. I'd kept it all inside for some time, and it had started to boil and rage until I just snapped. If I couldn't get this revolution, I would get out. I was tired of holding the purse for this motley group of people who, they just gave it away as soon as it came in. And then I discovered I could get out with some of that 
dirty Roman money. It all happened so fast, the Romans approached me. They'd seen me, watched me, perhaps saw my indecision, my anger, my separation at times from the group. It just happened. And there I was at the table, knowing what I had set into motion. All of a sudden, I was flooded with panic as we all sat there. The air felt heavy with fear and unknown. At the table again, it reminded me of all the meals we had had. Sometimes, just us, this small band of disciples, but often with someone Jesus had invited to dinner, someone we couldn't believe, yet again, he was hanging out with. Sometimes it was hard to understand. People who took advantage of others, people who had no interest in supporting him, people who questioned him, people who were beneath him. Really, Jesus invited anyone to his table, bottom feeders. And then I realized as he stretched out the cup of wine to me and dipped the bread in it, that he saw right through me. He knew my thoughts. He was doing it once again, inviting a scoundrel to dinner. Only this time, it was me. He was offering to share the cup and break the bread with me. He would never hurt anyone. He loved us all, even the lowest of the low. Friends, just as Jesus did not hesitate to share the cup of wine with Judas, who he knew would betray him to the authorities, Jesus invites all of us, no matter our pain, our despair, our failures and faults. Jesus says, come and eat with me, for this grace can transform you. And so this night, you are invited, just like in the Last Supper, to share the food that nourishes our spirits on the journey. We remember his words that echoed that night to his disciples and that have echoed through the ages. I am always with you. Melissa will guide you so that wherever we are tonight, we may join our voices in responding together. The Lord be with you. And we, the people, say, and also with you. And also with you. Let your hearts be lifted even in the heaviness of your sorrow and fear. And we, the people, say, we lift them up to the Lord. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. And we, the people, say, it is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right to give our thanks and praise. In the midst of the events of the last week, the disciples had really floundered. It started out fine with excitement, really, as they had entered Jerusalem with crowds following along, singing and shouted. And we the people say, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord. Holy, Holy, Holy Lord. God of power and might. God of power and might. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Lord, Hosanna in the highest. Lord, Hosanna in the highest. But that excitement turned to doubt, questions, confusion, fear. This Jesus was the one who had proclaimed a message they could all believe in, the disciples thought. This was the one who had come to fulfill the scriptures, to proclaim release to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, 
and to announce that the time had come when God would save the people. And then that moment had come, the moment when Jesus said these words. On the night that he gave himself up for the message of peace, of hope, of justice, the night he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, O God, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, and said, Take and eat, for this is my body, which is given for you. And for the first time, in his next words, sent a chill down their spine. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup. He gave thanks to you. He gave it to his disciples, and he said, Drink from this, all of you. This is the cup of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Enter, into the passion, into the place we belong, not just looking on, for this is our passion, into the passion, into the story, into the passion. Tonight and each night, we eat and drink of this meal. We enter into his story, his passion, remembering the death of Jesus. But we also know the rest of the story. We know that what emerges from death is always life. And so we proclaim this night to each other and to the world, repeating after me. Christ has died. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Christ will come again. I invite you to take a piece of bread from where you are, place it in your hands, and then raise your hands in the ancient Christian posture of prayer. And let us pray. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us, gathered here this night, just as you did on our ancient ancestors. Pour out your Holy Spirit on these gifts of bread and wine. Let them be for us the body and blood of Christ, so that we may be for the suffering world the body of Christ, liberated by his witness, passion, and resurrection. Let us die to the ways of injustice so that we may live again in your promise. Let us be inspired to proclaim hope, peace, love, and justice in your name. Tonight, we are together from separate locations. So as a way of demonstrating our connectedness, you are invited to put your hands on the shoulder of someone near you if you're comfortable doing so or on your electronic device through which you are joining us this evening, as Pastor Shannon continues to pray. By your Spirit we are one with Christ, whose memory, whose presence was real to his disciples, and is real to us even now. By this Spirit we are one with each other. Let this love be seen in us outside of this place, and to all God's people say amen i invite you to serve one another around your own table at home by receiving your bread and cup into into the passion into the place we belong not just looking on for this is our passion into the passion, into the story, into his passion. At this time, I invite you to light a candle with me, and I encourage you to please keep it lit until I light 
until the light that we have lit has, is blown out at the end of the service. After dinner, they went to the Garden of Gethesda, and Jesus prayed. And then the soldiers came, and they arrested Jesus. They took him to the council and to the governor's palace, where they tried to make it look like a trial, but it wasn't. And then finally, they led him away to the place where criminals were hung, always on crosses, so that they would die slowly and painfully. Jesus was hung between two other crosses, bandits on each side of him, and the sign over Jesus' cross said, This was the King of the Jews. The scene was horrifying. Not that I wasn't used to crucifixions. They were the favorite way of putting prisoners to death by the Romans, and so I assisted many times. But I'd heard about this man, Jesus. We thought Barabbas was going to be on the cross, but the crowds had become almost out of control. And I heard that Pilate simply washed his hands of it, sent this one to die, and shut them up. Who knows what these crowds really were screaming about. There was so much confusion and rumor. No one will probably ever know the truth. That's what I think. But when the reality hit his followers that Jesus was really going to die, and they saw him headed to Golgotha with the cross, the horror really began. Even the heavens seemed to be wailing as storms began to appear gave me a chill, I'm going to tell you. These are not the things that I want to tell you. I am a soldier. It's always easier protecting others than protecting yourself from the mothers who beg for mercy for their sons, from those who insist on waiting the hours and even days it takes to die this agonizing death. Being a soldier can't always protect you from what you witness firsthand, like hearing Jesus talk to the prisoners on the other two crosses next to him. The promise that death is not the end for them. And then he looked at me, right at me. And he spoke the words I'll hear for the rest of my life and the words that mean I can no longer do this job anymore. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Later, after Jesus died, they, they pierced him in his side. I still don't understand why, but in that moment, I knew that he was truly the Son of God. His blood poured out just like the love he poured out for his people. The blood flowed from his side. The blood flowed. The love flowed.
Enter the passion, enter the place.